In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. My dear sisters and brothers in Christ, the year was 1986. A group of uh, 25 politicians, scientists, doctors, psychiatrists got together and they hatched a plan that in their mind was setting out to save the world. And like every great save the world plan, I think in the history of our country, it started right here in California. Some of you will remember this. A task force was formed in 1986 called the California Task Force to promote self-esteem and personal and social responsibility. Do you remember this? Some of you are laughing. Some of you are shaking your heads. It was pretty influential. It was started by a California assemblyman up from San Jose. They finally convinced the governor to sign the bill when they lowered their budget down to $245,000. And here was their thought. That if we can just find a way to boost the self-esteem of all Californians then we will be able to lower, if not eradicate altogether, all of the social ills that plague us in our world. So if we just got people thinking highly enough of themselves, well, you know, then things like domestic violence and alcohol and drug abuse and teenage pregnancies and homelessness and welfare dependency, all of these things would just poof. Go away. And so they got to work. Four years later, they presented their findings in a document titled Toward a State of Esteem. And it was then, and as far as I can tell, still is the best-selling state document that has ever been produced. They sell these things, apparently. 60,000 copies were sold. And despite all of that, the document, as maybe you can imagine, was brutally mocked by critics, and it was completely discredited by social scientists. And in 1990, the task force was defunded. And yet, though the task force died, this belief in this idea, this having this super high value of what self-esteem can do for a person, that did not die with it, did it? In fact, I think you could make the case that we address and we talk about and we value self-esteem more now in the last two decades than any other time in world history. Now, I know a lot of you blame my generation, right? We're the ones who who give our kids participation trophies and all that kind of stuff. But i got to tell you, I was born in the early 80s. <clears throat> and guess what? We were the generation that was given the participation trophies. I remember this. I remember kids, other kids, other kids getting the yellow ribbon at the track meets in grade school. A yellow ribbon. You ask, what place is a yellow ribbon? That's just it. It isn't a place. It didn't matter. You got a ribbon for showing up. I remember that. So should it really shock us then that 30 years later, we've now morphed that into our universities are giving scholarships, academic scholarships, based on not academics. Because we don't want you to take SETs, we don't want you to take ACTs, we don't want to look at your grades, we don't want to know what your scores are, because we don't want to crush the social-emotional status of our youth. And we can't even point fingers as Christians, if that's what it sounds like I'm doing, because we bought into this hook, line, and sinker. You see, like so many big movements in the world, we think that we can take them and Christianize them. 
We like the concept. We like the idea. And if we can just insert some God stuff into it, then we're, we're really going to let this thing take off. By the way, that never works. But we always try it. And so you, you'll see like a, a, a young, maybe a teenage girl who's struggling with body image issues. And instead of turning her to God, we, we take Bible passages and we rip them out of their context and, and we turn her more toward herself and we say something like, but you are fearfully and wonderfully made. We pull that from Psalm 139. But here's the problem. Read Psalm 139. It's not about how wonderful and beautiful and amazing and marvelous we and our bodies are. It's an entire psalm about how wonderful and amazing and marvelous and glorious and creative God is. Or this is my favorite, the, the golden rule. Right? Love your neighbor as yourself. How do you screw that up? How do you twist that? How do you make that say something else? Well, we do. Do you know how most people interpret that passage these days? It means this, that if you are ever going to be able to love your neighbor, well, then you first have to love yourself. So spend time getting to know yourself and valuing yourself and looking at yourself in the mirror and pumping yourself up and hopefully when the day comes that you can finally accept yourself and love yourself, then you can finally turn your attention to your neighbor and try and love them in the same way. Like we don't naturally love ourselves more than other people. You see, it takes that whole passage and it says, Jesus... The problem here is not our lack of love for those who are not ourselves. The problem with this, really the problem with the whole human condition, is a self-esteem problem. We just don't think highly enough of ourselves. And so in a lot of ways, we've created our own Christian task force. And this is what we do. You know who did not put a lot of stock in self-esteem and who most certainly would not have been allowed to serve on that 25-member task force? The Apostle Paul. Paul didn't really have a whole lot of patience for self-esteem. Did you catch this in our second scripture reading from 1 Corinthians? Here's what Paul wrote by inspiration of God's Spirit to the congregation in Corinth. He said, brothers and sisters, think about what you were when you were called. Now that's an important thing to do and we should all do that. Think about what you were before you were a Christian. Think about what you were when God called you out of the darkness of your unbelief and brought you into the marvelous light of faith. In other words, you have to wrestle with this question of what was it that attracted God to me? What was it that made God look at me and say, I gotta have her. I want him on my team. And whatever that thing is, whatever the answer is, well, then that's your ticket. I mean, that's the thing you just need to pump up, and that's the thing you need to follow, and that's the thing you need to fill and feed, and then you're going to be able to get out of the rat race. You're not going to have to worry about pumping yourself up with self-esteem because that'll be the answer to all of your social ills. Not really. Notice Paul doesn't wait for the Corinthians to answer. He knows the answer. And so he gives it to them. He says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were called when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. Paul has no time for self-esteem. And you know why that is? Because Paul knows something that we really ought to get on board with, and it's this. That when it comes to your ego, whether it, you have a high ego, a very high view of yourself, or a low ego, a, a low view of yourself, it really doesn't matter. An ego can only do one thing. It cannot love other people. 
It won't allow you to. That's kind of the whole point and purpose of having an ego. It comes from the Latin word, I am. Your ego will not love other people. Not the way that God wants you to anyway. Because having an ego only allows you to do one thing. And here it is. It only allows you to use people. And the way that you and I most commonly use people is we view them as our measuring stick. So either they are people who are above us and they're a good goal for us to reach and to surpass, or we see them as people who we have already surpassed, people who are beneath us, and then we don't have to bother worrying about them and we can kind of just walk all over them. That is what Paul is saying to the Corinthians. This is what you're doing. And if you read the rest of this letter of 1 Corinthians, you'll see that this really is at the heart and core of every single issue that existed in that congregation. Was their inability to see one another as people. Rather, they only saw one another as a means to an end. As something to be used. Paul says you're trying to live your life according to worldly standards. You're trying to use one another to pull vault over one another, to doormat one another, to live your life and to do all of these things, to evaluate the success of your life by the standards of this world. That's all you will ever do. And, and you and I get this, don't we? You, you know this is how life works, right? So you go to a dinner party and someone is sitting around the table and they're telling their big fish story, right? Isn't there always that annoying guy that has to just like butt in and up the ante? Or maybe you're, you're picking your kids up from school and you got cornered by that really brazen woman you know, the one who just constantly is title or name dropping about some celebrity that she's friends with or she saw at the grocery store? Why? Why do we do these things? Why do you and I work so hard to project this image of ourselves on social media, to curate this perfect facade of what we want people to think we're like and our lives are like? Are, are you hesitant to, to kind of mingle with and surround yourself with people who are of a lower status than you? Why is that? Are we maybe a little worried that they might drag us down to their level? Aren't we constantly shooting to have friends and acquaintances that are of a higher status than us because they're going to bring us up to their level? This is why it's so easy to get lost for hours, doom scrolling on the internet, reading the news, wasting time on social media, because this is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. We're looking to see how we measure up. Whom have I pole vaulted over this week? Who is growing and moving up faster than I am? We're playing the self-esteem game. Who's more influential? Who's better? Who's more beautiful? Who's more successful? Who's stronger? You know what really all of that is? You know, this, you know where this comes from? This I'm more, I'm better, I'm this, I'm that. It goes by a lot of names. It, maybe you, you've heard it referenced as self-justification. But I think another way to look at it is spiritual compensation. We do those things and we say those things because deep down inside of us, there is someone who feels about this big. And yet, despite his or her tiny size, it is one of the loudest, loudest and most clear voices in our lives. It is constantly shouting at us all of our lives' failures, the, the, the deep depravity that we have, the, the, the things that we're capable of doing, 
how weak and how sinful and how broken we are and how prone to failure we can become. It's the voice that reminds us, you know you're not really the person that you've tried to convince everyone that you are. You're not that good looking. You're not that successful. I know who you are. You know who you are. Just give it a rest. You know that voice. I do. And how much you have to do to compensate, to overcome that voice. How much you have to do to make up for those failures. So you know what I'm not going to do this morning? Knowing that you've got that voice, knowing that you've got that little person in your life that's shouting you down, you know what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to coddle you this morning. I'm not going to pat you on the back and say, you know what, there, there. God is just happy so long as you are trying your best. I'm not going to try and build up that little person's self-esteem. I'm not going to try and mold or shape or reform that person because it cannot be done. No, instead, Paul says, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. And you hear that and you might think that the point of this is, okay, this is Paul just beating people down. This is Pastor Bader just trying to knock us off our high horse, trying to make you nothing. But you know, the point that Paul is actually making is he's actually telling you who your God is. Who the God is. Paul says, think about what you were when you were called, and then you tell me what that says about your God. It says that your God is the God of the beaten up and the broken and the nothing. Paul tells the Corinthians to look around their congregation. The answer to the question of why did God call me into his family is not you. But it has everything to do with God. If Paul's writing these words, and he would have had in mind, you know, to have the Corinthians look around at their fellow brothers and sisters and say, look, look at the slave, the former slave sitting in the corner. Do you know what he says about God? That God did not call you because you were wealthy. Or, or think about that former prostitute balled up in the corner who drags herself to church every Sunday morning just to weep the entire hour. Do you know what she says about your God? That God did not call you into his family because of how moral you were. No, Paul says, not many of you were any of these things. Not many of you were influential. God doesn't call you into his church because he sees in you a future where you're going to be a real mover and shaker in this congregation. And if that isn't enough to convince you that when God deals with people, when he gathers his church, he does so in an entirely otherworldly way, Paul goes even further than that. He gets even more insulting. Paul is so desperate for you to know that when it comes to everything you think you know about value and worth and importance in this world, you have to know that God takes that and he flips it upside down. I was reading a commentary actually on these verses this week and the author said, if you're going to preach on these words, don't say what I'm going to say next. He said, people will get upset, they'll get up and they'll walk out, they won't be able to handle it. But you know what? Paul said it to his congregation, and so I'm going to say it to mine. Paul is talking about the Corinthians, and this is what he said. 
God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And it's actually even more shocking in Greek. That word foolish in Greek is the word mora. We get an English word from that. You know what it is? God called the mora things. The morons. God called the morons. That's what Paul says. When you look out at your congregation, Paul says, this is what you'll find. What were you when you were called, Paul says? Well, God chose the mora things of this world. I don't know that Paul can make it any clearer. And before you get upset and you walk out, remember, Paul is first and foremost talking about God. Do you know what this means? It means that your God is the God of the shamed and the rejected. Your God is the God of the foolish and the moronic. Your God is the God of the broken and the sinner and the despised. That's who your God is. God chooses those everyone else rejects. God welcomes into his family those who have been despised by their own. God loves to love the people that everyone else thinks are unlovable. Jesus came to be, this is what it means with, when it comes to Jesus. This is what it means when it comes to the gospel. This is it. This is the message. Think about what Jesus was when he was called. He was everything that you and I are not. That, that person that deep down you and I know that falls short, Jesus was the loving and the kind and the generous and the selfless that we are not. And yet he became God's 180. He, he became God's reversal, God's world-flipping Savior. Jesus became what you and I are to make us what we were not. So Jesus became God's rejected one, so that you are now God's accepted one. Jesus became God's despised one, so that you are now God's affirmed one. Jesus became God's throwaway, so that you would be God's most prized possessions. Listen to those verses again. And instead of thinking about this is what God is telling me about me. Listen to these words as they preach Christ. But God chose the foolish things, the mora one. God chose Jesus. God chose the weak one, the lowly one, the despised one, the one who was not. God chose Jesus, foolish weak, lowly, despised Jesus. The Corinthians were not exhibit A for how God operates in the world. No, Jesus is. Christ crucified is. And no one needs to hear that message more than you this morning. Because that message is all for you. Jesus is foolish, and weak and lowly and despised for you. Paul says, It is because of God that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Think of what you were when you were called. Why did God choose you? What motivated him to call you into his family? Paul says, It is because of God that you are in Christ Jesus. And here's the picture. This picture of being in Christ Jesus. Paul uses some words here that, that, that give the picture of it being like a circle or a sphere or a ball. And the title of that ball, that circle, is in Christ 
Jesus so that everything within, everything inside that ball, inside that sphere, gets all of the blessings and benefits of who Jesus is and what he has done. And, and Paul says that inner circle, that's where you exist. That is where you live your whole life. In Christ Jesus. Who is your righteousness, holiness, and redemption. You work so hard. You labor so long to hide the bad and showcase the good. You strive tirelessly in life, just hoping that someone will notice, begging for someone to put a gold star on the forehead of your efforts. But get this, the CEO of the entire universe, the God of heaven and earth, has already placed his mark over your entire life. And you know what that mark is? Righteous. Baptized. Restored. Forgiven. Set free. All because you are in Christ Jesus. You, you try and you work and you study to acquire more and achieve more in the hopes that maybe you'll be able to set yourself apart from the rest. You want to be different and you want to be unique and you want to be special. You want to be somebody in a world full of nobodies. That's what holiness is. It means to be set apart. So get this. You are so special and so unique you are so set apart and holy that God wrote the check for your life with the blood of his only son, who is your holiness. You get up early and you stay up late. You work overtime. You sacrifice time with family and friends to build up your personal brand and your business empire and to leave your lasting legacy because you are trying to prove to everyone else that you matter, that you have value. You want redemption for your life. But get this. You have been handed the keys to the kingdom of heaven. You are completely and utterly redeemed because Christ is your redemption and you exist in him. Therefore, it's such an important word for Paul. Here's his rousing conclusion. Paul says, therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. And do you notice what's missing there? Any reference to the self. You don't have to up anyone's fishing story ever again. You don't have to worry about name dropping unless it's his, because that's really the only one that matters. You don't have to feel ashamed if your kid doesn't make varsity or become valedictorian of their class. You don't have to worry what other people are going to think about you if you get stuck in some mid-level management position for the rest of your career. You can actually forget about yourself. You can. You can forget about yourself because your identity is no longer about yourself or about what you've created but your identity is now completely and entirely selfless because your identity is in Christ. And do you know what that makes people now for you instead? It makes them, get this, it makes them people. Not means to an end or objects to be used for your advancement, you can see people as just being people. And then you know what you can do with them? You can actually love them. And you can relate to them. 
and you can get close to them, and you can be vulnerable for them. You see them as gifts in your life, gifts to be loved, instead of competition to be overcome. Some Christians refer to this whole kind of forgetfulness as a blessed self-forgetfulness. A blessed self-forgetfulness. And here's why. Because it is so blissfully freeing to live without listening to your pesky little ego. Blessed self-forgetfulness. Brothers and sisters, you have nothing left to prove. You have nothing else to gain. You have nothing else to demonstrate, not to yourself, not to anyone else, because God has made you in Christ, which means that you are righteous and holy and redeemed. Believe that. Boast in that. Glory in that. That you are the most sought after human being in the history of the world. Because God won you. May God grant you the faith to rejoice in that today and always. Amen.